The expansive Zelda universe has seen many races, tribes, groups and civilizations come and go over the years, some being present from the very beginning of time and others vanishing at random points of history for unknown and, in some cases, known reasons. Every race or group can be found all across Hyrule in the current age as it's a rather welcoming kingdom. It hasn't always been this way however. Each respective group of people have their main settlements such as the Zora typically being located within Zora's domain, the Gorons being housed within or on Death Mountain, and the Gerudo typically being far out within the Gerudo Desert. But the Gerudo have always been a bit of an outsider race. Not necessarily by choice either. You see, the Gerudo have a very complicated history with parts of it which even we as the player don't know or can't explain. Their true origin is a mystery. Their connection to the King of Evil Ganondorf is an interesting time frame to study, and their way of life and evolution over the years is also a mystery as they appear to be a dying race by the times of Twilight Princess and Four Swords Adventures, but seemingly appear to be a well established group come Breath of the Wild. Point being, the history of the Grudo is an incomplete one, and I thought it would be a really fun idea to make a sort of Grudo history video, explaining their full history with a combination of facts but also theories to fill in the gaps, such as their origin, disappearances, what happened to them in each individual timeline, and so on. The inspiration behind all of this is both the new players brought into or back into the series with Breath of the Wild, but haven't been able to play or learn the lore of the older games, and B, my girlfriend requested that I cover the Grudo for her birthday which is actually today, so happy birthday babe. If you enjoy, let me know and maybe I'll do more of this on other Zelda races, tribes, groups and such as I understand a large majority of fans at the moment have only played Breath of the Wild but have an interest in the older games. Be sure to remember that this will be partially theories and partially facts, as well as that this video took a tremendous amount of effort so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and let's get to 100k subs very soon. Now, sit back. Be sure to go and grab yourself a snack or drink and send them in to get featured right here and let's go over the complete history of the Gerudo in The Legend of Zelda. In the chronological Zelda timeline, the Gerudo make their first official appearance during the events of Ocarina of Time. They play the role of a band of thieves, notorious for their way of life, stealing for a living, hiding out in the harsh desert, but this isn't believed to be where they truly started off, so we'll come back to this. Rather, it is believed by many fans that the Gerudo actually originate from the first chronological game, Skyward Sword. This is the game in which we learn of how Hyrule came to be following the Ceiling of Demise. This is the earliest point of the Zelda timeline, and we see a few races. The Gorons, the Kikwi, the Parella, the Mogma, the Sheikah and the Skyloftians, who later went on to become the Hylians upon the establishment of Hyrule shortly after the events of the game. You could also consider the Loftwings, Demons and Robots as races, but I'm not quite sure to be honest. Regardless, there was no sign of the Grudo in the game of Zelda Origin. So why do fans believe they started back here? Well, that is thanks to one man. Groose. If you've played Skyward Sword, you'll know that Groose is a bit of a loved character. He is a little bit of a meanie at first, but ultimately has a really fun personality, which shines later in the game. But is his connection to the Grudo true? Well, as we know, in Gerudo lore, there is only one Gerudo male born every 100 years. Now, it is debatable whether this means every 100 years from the birth of the first male Gerudo, or... 100 years after the death of the current male Gerudo. Personally, I believe the former, but we'll be delving into that some more later in the video. Groose shares common Gerudo traits, traits which no other character appears to possess in this game. He has red hair and golden eyes, the two main features of the Gerudo. It has been commonly theorised by fans that Groose may actually be the forefather of the Gerudo. A popular theory is that upon Groose landing on the surface and being told by Granny that he has a role there on the surface, Obviously this actually means aiding Link, but it has been suggested that the role didn't stop there. His role was to start a new race, the Gerudo. Which if true, would actually make the Gerudo very close to Hylians. I mean, they are more often referred to as the Gerudo tribe and not the Gerudo race, but Nintendo themselves have said both. I typically say tribe personally. The point is, they do resemble Hylians, just a lot bigger and stronger. Funny enough, so is Groose compared to the rest of the Skyloftians. Another part of this theory is that when Demise's curse was laid down, Groose was included, putting his soon-to-be race of people in some form of incarnation every 100 years, which is why we 
we only see one male Gerudo every 100 years, but that is just the theory. So the theory goes that Groose basically started the tribe, which I'm sure I don't need to explain the details on how, but you get the point. The main point here is that their origin is a bit of a mystery, and the only real somewhat solid theory slash suggestion is that Groose was the first, due to his red hair and golden eyes, but we can't say for sure. Although, there is one fact to remember about their origin. In Gerudo lore, there can only be one Gerudo male born every 100 years. It isn't actually said that there can only be one at a time, but presumably they don't typically live past 100. Well, most. The male Gerudo isn't necessarily Ganondorf either, which is a commonly confused fact. He just happens to be the male Gerudo of that time frame during All Queen of Time, Twilight Princess, The Wind Waker, and Four Swords Adventures. As in three of those games, he is the same man, and one, he is just reincarnated. With the mysterious origins now covered, let's get into the first chronological appearance of the Gerudo. Between the very beginning of Hyrule and Ocarina of Time, there are only two games taking place, the Minish Cap and Four Swords. The Gerudo appear in neither of those games, which could be down to them not being a very well established group yet, but come Ocarina of Time, we finally meet the Gerudo for the first time. Outside the central regions of Hyrule lies Gerudo Valley, a blistering hot canyon leading to the harsh deserts outside of central Hyrule. This is the home of the Gerudo. Across the bridge of the valley is considered Gerudo territory, and following down the slender crevices of the valley, we can find the Gerudo Fortress, the home of these warriors. During this period of time, the Gerudo are actually sworn allies of the royal family. Following the Hyrulean Civil War, prior to the events of the game, the Gerudo swore fealty to the royal family, and the desert became under their control. However, their leader of this time, Ganondorf, had other ideas. A common misconception about this time frame is that the Gerudo as a whole were evil, which is actually false. Ganondorf was the evil one, but as the only male Gerudo of this time frame, tradition states that he becomes their leader. So the band of female warriors are simply following him. They themselves may not actually agree with him, but they do follow him. Ganondorf lies to the King of Hyrule early in the game, swearing his allegiance to the King, but ultimately this was part of his master plan to take over the entire kingdom, which he eventually succeeds in. Which would explain why upon his takeover of the kingdom, the Gerudo settlements remain intact and unharmed, unlike Castletown which was destroyed and overrun, Zoro's domain which was frozen over, and the Gorons which were imprisoned within the Fire Temple. However, the Gerudo, his people, remained untouched. So technically yes, the Gerudo are evil, but only because their leader is. It is just their way of life at this point in time to make the male Gerudo of that time their leader, and Ganondorf just so happened to have ill intent. Well, that is also because he is part of Demise's curse. Aside from the story of the Gerudo during this time, let's take a look at the warriors themselves. We know that the Gerudo are based on Amazons, an ancient Greek legend of an all-female race of warriors. This is evident in the game. Link enters the Gerudo fortress in an attempt to free the carpenters who were taken captive by the Gerudo for being on their land. Instantly upon confrontation, we learn just how skillful the Gerudo are. They are extremely fast, agile, and precise, sporting dual blades which double as a shield when put together. Unlike many enemies which can be chopped down in a matter of seconds, Gerudo warriors take real effort and timing. In my opinion, besting a Gerudo warrior is a patience game, waiting for the perfect time to strike, as going in full force will result in their agility getting the better of you. I mean, they even pull off backflips like Link to dodge attacks. Whilst incredible warriors, they can be bested by the hero, and when that happens, the leader of the fort says to Link, I've seen your fine work. To get past the guards here, you must have good thieving skills. I used to think that all men, except for the great Ganondorf, were useless, but now that I've seen you, I don't think so anymore. The exalted Niburu, our leader put me in charge of this fortress. Niburu is the second in command to the great Ganondorf, king of the Gerudo thieves. Her headquarters are in the spirit temple, which is at the end of the desert. Say, you must want to become one of us, eh? Alright then, you're in from now on, take this. With it, you will have free access to all areas of the fortress, and thus she gives him a token, granting him permission. This quote shows us the leadership they see in Ganondorf, and how strong their traditions are at this point in time, something that we'll see change further down the line. Following this, Link can meet Niburu in the Spirit Temple. As we know, Niburu is actually one of the sages that plays a role in taking down Ganondorf, but I hear you asking, Mr. Hyrule Gamer, how can she be a sage 
and a follower of Ganondorf. Well, Nibiru actually had her rebellion against the King of Thieves planned, as not only had she become the new Sage of Spirits, but also she didn't agree with his ways, ultimately aiding Link in his battle against her former leader. Now, one thing that we haven't covered yet is who was Ganondorf's mother? It is said that one Gerudo male is born every 100 years, but who exactly gave birth to this king? Well, the boss of the Spirit Temple, Twin Rova, the combination of witches Kotake and Kuyume, Kuyume? Kuyume? are the surrogate mothers of Ganondorf. It's never explained how exactly this works, but I think this is just one of those things where we have to put our hands up as theorists and video game fans and say, well, it is a video game. This could also explain how Ganondorf lived so long over the course of multiple games. His mother, or mothers, were witches at the young, ripe age of 400 years old. Maybe they infused them with some kind of magic. Who knows. This is the state of the Gerudo during Ocarina of Time, but what happens following Ganondorf's defeat? Well, we can see the Gerudo celebrating at Lon Lon Ranch in the end credits, but their story doesn't end here, as these celebrations are before we go back in time, evident by Malon being an adult in this scene. Once Link does go back in time to warn the royal family of Ganondorf's betrayal, he is sentenced to execution, an event which we see during a flashback in Twilight Princess. This scene takes place several years following Ocarina of Time. By definition, several means more than two, but not by many. So we can guesstimate this is five years after Ocarina of Time. Due to their leader being caught and sentenced to execution following Ocarina of Time, it was said that these Gerudo fled the land. And before you ask, but why, they were celebrating. As mentioned, that was before Link was sent back in time. In the proper time frame, they actually flee their desert home and end up in the Desert of Doubt and Four Swords Adventures. But before going into that, we first must cover the games prior and the other timeline splits. Starting off with the Downfall timeline. The Gerudo in this split are non-existent. I mean, unless you count Ganon, who stems from Ganondorf but isn't really, they don't appear in a single game, which is honestly a bit odd considering this is the split where Ganon won. Video game logic, am I right? Honestly, I don't know how to explain this. I mean, maybe in the monster, bestial form of Ganon, he had just lost his mind and rampaged all over the kingdom, killing everyone. Who knows? Well, since that timeline was a bit of a dead end, or start, you know, since it never even featured the Gerudo. Anyway, moving over to the adult timeline. This is the split where during the events of Ocarina of Time, no hero was present upon Ganon's attack. As a result, the gods flooded the land to prevent any further damage, thus creating the Great Sea and the backstory of the Wind Waker. In this game, Hyrule is no more. Well, it is, but deep below the waves of the Great Sea. Everyone who survived the Great Flood seek refuge on mountaintops which have now become islands. Ganondorf himself appears in this game, but the Gerudo as a whole don't. And before getting into his story, there are some Gerudo remains to take a look at. The Forsaken Fortress can be found in the northwest of the Great Sea, a rocky island citadel with beaming watchlights crawling with moblins and bokoblins. At first glance, this is just a fortress controlled by monsters, but this is actually said to be the very same fortress from Ocarina of Time the Gerudo Fortress. Firstly, the question I'd be asking is how was it not flooded? Well, my best guess to this would be that the point of the valley it was located within was high above sea level. We saw in Ocarina of Time rather large cliff tops, so perhaps the point we explored was rather high up. It's hard to believe, but, and I hate to break Fierce's laws again, this is a video game. We can actually back this idea up, as Tetra herself talks about how this place used to be the home of another clan of no good pirates, referring to the thieves of the Gerudo, who in other games are technically pirates. Obviously, it's not one for one, as this is a completely different video game, but the similarities are there. Both consist of prison cells, wooden beams, and the corridors. The symbolism has definitely changed, but we can put that down to this game taking place at sea, and this being more fitting, sporting two carved blades, which funny enough were the weapons of choice by the Gerudo warriors which once inhabited this place. Aside from the fortress, we meet the King of Evil once again, but this time, he is the only Gerudo present. 
We meet him within the Forsaken Fortress, as he uses it as his little hideout whilst he sends the Helmorok King to seek out girls with pointy ears, seeking Princess Zelda. The fact that he uses this location as his hideout further supports it being of Gerudo origin. In this game, Ganondorf plays the role of a man out for revenge. From his view, everything was taken from him and his people, their home completely destroyed and washed away beneath the waves. We don't have many interactions with the man himself until the final moments of the game below the waves atop Ganondorf tower, but this is where we understand his pain, as he says the following moments before the final boss fight. My country lay within a vast desert. When the sun rose into the sky, a burning wind punished my lands, searing the world. And when the moon climbed into the dark night, a frigid gale pierced our homes. No matter when it came, the wind carried the same thing, death. But the winds that blew across the green fields of Hyrule brought something other than suffering and ruin. I coveted that wind. I suppose. Now, whilst we don't see any remains of this land in game, through the help of camera tools, we can actually view this location from below, and it appears to be set in a desert washed below the waves. Likely the Gerudo Desert from times long ago. Ganondorf's former home. This really ties this fight together. This really ties the. This really ties this quote and fight in general together. Ganondorf about to go battle in vengeance of his land, his people, his life. Upon the sealing of Ganondorf in this battle, the Gerudo are never seen again in the adult timeline. Now for the child timeline. Following the events of Ocarina of Time which we covered earlier, comes Majora's Mask. Now there is a forever ongoing debate amongst fans as to whether the land this game takes place in, Termina, is or isn't real. Some fans argue it is in the same world as Hyrule, and others claim it is a parallel. To cater to both sides, I will go over an answer for each, as ultimately I cannot answer that question today. But firstly, let's take a look at the Gerudo in this game. In the land of Termina, the Gerudo are known as the Gerudo Pirates, as they live in the Great Bay, specifically Pirate's Cove. Similar to their fortress in Ocarina of Time, they are housed in the Pirate's Fortress, a heavily guarded stronghold. Unlike tradition dictates, we see no male Gerudo in this game, rather their leader is Avil. They have a bit of a storyline this time around. They stole some Zora eggs from Lulu, as seemingly Skull Kid told them that eggs are the key to entering the Great Bay Temple, which is said to contain treasure. As pirates, this was an opportunity. Part of the storyline is also why we find Maku, Maku, however you say his name, dying on the beach, as he was a friend of Lulu, trying to recover the eggs. But the pirates had beat him so bad that he died shortly after meeting Link. He managed to ask Link to finish what he'd started, moments before dying. Following this, Link infiltrates the pirate fortress to retrieve the eggs, and this is where we discover the skills of these pirates. Similar to Ocarina of Time, they are agile warriors, only this time they can be seen to attack in groups. One of the eggs is guarded by three Gerudo swordswomen, and Link must take on all three to retrieve an egg. After the Gerudo found out that all the eggs were stolen, or rather taken back by Link, the Gerudo set out to find the Zora and Green responsible, as Link was actually using the Zora mask at this point. Following this part of the story, Link later enters the temple, but the Gerudo pirates stupidly try to follow him in on their boat, but the temple is surrounded by a literal cyclone. I mean, I'm not calling their decision making stupid, but yeah. They got completely thrown out. The only other time we see the Gerudo in this game is during the credit scenes as we can see them sailing around the bay, perhaps patrolling as we know the Gerudo are known to be territorial. This is all we really see of them in this game. They don't play a huge role, rather just part of a dungeon storyline, which is really cool in my opinion. In terms of lore, I previously mentioned that there could be two answers here. If we go with the idea that Terminar is a parallel world, then that answers itself. These are just the Grudo of this parallel. But if we are to say that Termina is within the same world of Hyrule, I believe that these Grudo are to a degree the same as those seen in Ocarina of Time, but a different division if you like, or branch. They stem from the same origin, but over the years travelled and established themselves and their way of life elsewhere in the world. One thing we know for sure is that they are not the exact same from Ocarina of Time as mentioned earlier. Those Gerudo left for the Desert of Doubt, which we will get to shortly. It's never explained to us, so we do have to speculate here, but that is the story of the Gerudo in Majora's Mask. Following these events comes Twilight Princess. The adventure in Twilight taking place around 100 years after Ocarina of Time. Similar to the Wind Waker, the only Gerudo we see in this game is Ganondorf. 
Well, the only confirmed Gerudo. We'll get to Ganondorf shortly, but first let's take a look at what's left of the Gerudo people. 100 years following Ocarina of Time, the Gerudo are nowhere to be seen. The desert is empty, almost abandoned, and there are no signs of civilization to be seen out here. It does make sense though, as the Gerudo of 100 years ago fled to the Desert of Dao, but there are suspected Gerudo in this game, or at least Gerudo Bloodline. In the southwest end of Castletown, we can find a little tucked away tavern called Telma's Bar. In here, we can meet Telma herself, and she is our suspected Gerudo. Off the bat, she shares a few traits. Most notably, the red hair and jewellery. It's not a set in stone theory, but many fans believe Telma to have Gerudo blood, a part Hylian, part Gerudo. She has Hylian traits too, such as her pointed ears, but also sports a Gerudo-esque build. It's not confirmed, but something worth mentioning. Telma aside, the King of Evil Ganondorf is our confirmed Gerudo of this game, and this is in fact the very same man from Ocarina of Time. After Link was sent back in time following Ocarina of Time, Ganondorf was caught out and sentenced to execution. That execution is something we see during Twilight Princess via cutscene. The sages impaled the king with their blade, but the power of the Triforce within him allowed him to break free from his shackles and murder one of the sages. Before more damage could be done, the remaining sages quickly banished him to the Twilight Realm, which is somewhere they thought he would be gone for good. However, they were wrong. Within this plane of darkness, where the light doesn't shine and the sun doesn't rise, Ganondorf met Zant. Combining their powers, they broke free of the realm and began their invasion on Hyrule with the power of Twilight, infecting the land in a thick glow of darkness. The story of Twilight Princess is phenomenal, and one of the things I love about it is that we don't meet Ganondorf until the very end of the game. We chase his puppet worker Zant up until the end, when we can finally confront the King of Evil as he sits on the Hylian throne. As the thunder crashes behind him, Princess Zelda held high above, trapped within Ganondorf's power, thus kicking off what in my opinion is the greatest final boss battle in all of Zelda. Ganondorf possessed Princess Zelda and forced Link to fight her. He then turned into his bestial form Dark Beast Ganon, a good version of it anyway. Then after demolishing Hyrule Castle, we fight him on horseback in Hyrule Field to finally get a one-on-one -on -one duel in the open grass. The Gudo King puts up a sensational fight, but ultimately Link triumphs and pushes the massive sword directly through his chest, in the same spot the sages did long ago, thus putting the king to an end, killing him, putting evil from 100 years ago to bed once and for all. And this is an interesting thing to think about. It was said that a Gerudo male is born every 100 years. This is the same Ganondorf around 100 years later, so clearly he lives this long. This is what I meant earlier by perhaps his surrogate mothers infused him with some sort of magic to allow him to live longer, as he definitely hasn't aged that much. It's just something interesting to think about. Following these events, we come to the end of the child timeline with Four Sword Adventures. The Gerudo way of life at this point in time is rather complicated. After their leader's arrest and planned execution between Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, they left the desert for a new home, the Desert of Doubt. This game takes place hundreds of years after Ocarina of Time, and after finding this new home, they began working on restoring their relationship with the Hylians by denouncing their former leader. During Ocarina of Time, following the Civil War, the Gerudo were under the impression that they were allied with the Hylians, only for Ganondorf to change his mind and betray that agreement. By the time of this game, the Gerudo want things to be peaceful and well between the groups. As a result of this, they are no longer hostile to outsiders and rather welcoming people. They live rather nomadic lives, living in tents out in the desert. The desert's pyramid is considered sacred and holy to the Gerudo people, as it holds the Trident, an extremely powerful relic. By Gerudo law, it is forbidden for anyone to enter. This is where Ganondorf comes into play. He was reborn into the world, the second Ganondorf. We know the man seen in Ocarina of Time, the Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess is all the same man, but this is a new Ganondorf. However, he was expelled by the Gerudo and also explored the Forbidden Pyramid, and eventually reaching the Sacred Trident. But upon touching it, he turned into a beast. Ganon. In this time frame, Ganon is a manipulative monster. He tries to cloak the world in darkness using his newfound powers, and even tricks Link into releasing Vati from the Four Sword. This beast wrecks havoc across the land, 
After becoming Ganon, he becomes less Gerudo and more, well, Beast, but Gerudo nonetheless. Using the Dark Mirror, which he also stole, he summons Darkling. He absorbs the powers of the Shrine Maidens, and he even turns the Knights of Hyrule into demons. This is arguably the Gerudo King's strongest appearance so far, as it takes a Light Arrow to slay the Beast, a battle which takes place in the Dark World below the Tower of Winds. Following the demise of this beast, this is the last we see of the Gerudo in the Zelda timeline. That was Until Breath of the Wild. The Era of the Wild takes place far, far beyond the rest of the Zelda timeline. Whilst the land doesn't visually look overly advanced compared to times long ago, this is, believe it or not, thousands of years forward. In this time frame, the Gerudo are a very well established group. Their home can be found in the middle of the Gerudo Desert and is a well built sandstone haven. This place is beautiful. Whilst being far far in the future from their days of the past, their tradition has stayed alive in terms of being a fully female group. Gerudo Town is strictly for women only and this is made clear by trying to enter as good old Link, you know, the hero of Hyrule. Even he isn't allowed in, and will be instantly removed from the premises if he enters. Link can enter with a disguise however, which whilst breaking the law is necessary to save in Hyrule, so it's all good in the end. The Gerudo leader of this time frame is Riju, the 12 year old leader who was essentially forced into the role upon her mother's unexpected death. Now two things to make very clear. One. Riju's mother is not Arbosa. It is believed that they could be distantly related and probably are, but Riju's mother passed away shortly before Link woke up. Secondly, Riju is a literal child. Don't sexualize her. I've seen it happen and it really annoys me. Moving on. Upon meeting Lady Riju, we learn that the Gerudo Thunder Helm was stolen by the Yiga Clan, kicking off a questline where Link must retrieve it from the Yiga Clan hideout. Once retrieved, Link can enter Divine Beast Van Naboris, which is actually a reference to Naboru, with Riju's help, as she can use the helm to harness her thunder power in order to take the Divine Beast down. This is the main storyline of the Gerudo here, but there are actually a lot of interesting details to know about their way of life now. As you can tell, they aren't a hostile group whatsoever at this point in time, but don't think that they have lost their word like traits. They still have massive, built warrior women with a dedicated space for training and we can even see their abilities in both Age of Calamity and the memories. For one, we see Lady Abosa herself tackling two Yiga foot soldiers with ease whilst walking with Princess Zelda. I mean, look at her. What a queen. Breath of the Wild, in my opinion, is peak Gerudo. I mean, just look at them. What a queen. One of the things I love about them in this time frame is that they can be found all over the land. In past games, you'd maybe find one or two Gerudo at most out with their home, but in this day and age, you can find them all over the place, even after the calamity. Some want to travel and explore, whilst others are seeking a male partner to procreate with. And we even see this in a questline actually, which is one of my favourite quests. I find this really interesting as it was never something we saw in past games and Breath of the Wild really expands upon their way of life, not just explaining it to us, but visually showing us. Which for someone who learns better with visuals was very much appreciated. Whilst the current age of Gerudo is amazing, their past in this time frame is also interesting. We know the story of Breath of the Wild by now. The Calamity struck 100 years ago and wiped out most of the land, but funny enough, the Guardians never reached the Gerudo Desert. However, their former leader, Lady Urbosa, was killed in action within her Divine Beast. Urbosa was a true warrior, a true leader, and a true Gerudo. She was said to be close friends with Zelda's late mother, with some fans even suggesting they were a little bit more than friends, but that's for another day, and almost nurtured the princess, filling in the motherly role. Following her death, we don't know how many leaders came into command, but what we do know is that Riju's mother was one of them, or the only one, but died not long before Link woke up. It has been theorised that her mother... It has been theories it has been theorized that Riju's mother was assassinated by the Yiga clan, which is how they stole the heirloom, but that's purely speculative. This is why Riju fell into power so young, because her mother died. Presumably, her mother wasn't too old at this point, so I'd guess that there was a leader or two between Urbosa and Riju's mother. The history of the Gerudo during this time frame is rather complex, but something that is completely unknown entirely is, where is the male Gerudo of this time? Well, prior to the reveal of Breath of the Wild 2, we had no clue. 
Oh, that rhymes. The closest thing to a Grudel male would have been Calamity Ganon, which does have some of Ganondorf's traits, mainly in its face, but this thing is purely malice. We eventually saw the corpse of Ganondorf somewhere deep below the ground in the reveal trailer for the sequel, which has raised a lot of questions. Is this a Ganondorf we've seen before? Where is this? Has it stopped the cycle? And many more, but we sadly cannot answer them. But it really does beg the question of, is the cycle of a male Grudel born every 100 years from the first, or is one born every 100 years following the death of the current? If you were to say 100 from the current, then this would in fact be holding back the cycle, as Ganondorf is alive here, just contained and sealed by this hand. If not, it has also been speculated that, whilst a bit grim, that the Grudel actually kill the Grudel male every 100 years to prevent the past from repeating, which could actually be true. Well, either of those two ideas could be true, as we see that for at least three generations of Gerudo, they had female leaders, no man in charge, which is their tradition. But to be honest, what if by this point in time, that tradition is no more, making the male Gerudo their leader? Traditions aren't law, they can be broken or fade out of existence over time. Perhaps the whole male Gerudo thing was scrapped over the years, in terms of making them their leader. The male Gerudo of this time frame will likely remain questionable until the release of Breath of the Wild sequel, but for now, this is the state of the Gerudo in Breath of the Wild. To sort of conclude the video, one of the biggest things I learned about the Gerudo whilst making this is that there is so much depth to them. From an origin of mystery, to following the lead of Ganondorf, to disappearing into thin air, to being a peaceful and settled group in Breath of the Wild, a lot has changed over the years, but one thing that has evidently remained is the badass women. They are strong, fearless and skillful. I hope that this was helpful to those who haven't had the opportunity to play all of the older games and wanted to know more about the lore and stories of certain groups. Again, if you'd like to see more history videos like this, then definitely let me know. But with that, this concludes the complete history of the Gerudo. For now. Thanks a ton for watching, I really hope you enjoyed the video and if you did be sure to drop a like as this one took a tremendous amount of and also consider subscribing for more Zelda content. What do you think of my presentation on Grudo history? Of course a lot of it is theories and speculation as we simply don't know for sure but I hope it helped you to show more of how truly unique and lore rich the Gerudo are. Leave a comment below with your favourite Gerudo and what you thought of the video and look out for my replies. I'd actually like to dedicate this to not only my channel supporters but also my wonderful girlfriend. Marilyn, who was the brains behind this idea. It is her birthday today and I asked her if there would be a certain video she'd like to see for it, as believe it or not, she's my biggest fan. <laughs> and this was the idea. So happy birthday to you my love and I hope it is a good one. As always, a huge heartfelt thank you also goes out to all of my supporters across Patreon and YouTube. I cannot express enough to you how helpful and appreciated the support is. If you'd like to join them here at the end of all of my videos, get yourself a shout out upon joining and more, then consider support. Then consider supporting via Patreon or YouTube. Again, thanks for watching, and until the next time, I've been Hyrule Gamer.